Arts Board and, and also a member of uh, TFM's Lecture Committee. I want to welcome you to our panel today, Weeding Out Phragmites, and um, also welcome our speakers. Uh, before we get started, however, let me acknowledge the land and the people of the land. The Toronto Field Naturalists acknowledge this land through which we walk. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississauga of the Credit River. Today, it is still the home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to be on this land. Behind me, you'll see a picture I took a number of years ago of Phragmites. Um, that was in the time when I didn't know that Phragmites was a weed and not a reed, as many of my colleagues later told me. It's very photogenic and uh, you can get it in garden uh, nurseries to plant in your garden and so forth, but it's a, it's a fairly invasive species that is quite troublesome across Ontario. Uh, it grows to six meters with a dense brome-like flower head and it has a very thick knotted root system. And that root system is a real problem because particularly in wetlands, it tends to soak up standing water and it strangles other species like cattails, bulrushes and sedges. And it creates thick stands that um, amphibians and reptiles and marsh breeding birds have difficulty getting into and finding food. Now you're gonna hear a lot more about why it's a problem and what we're doing about it uh, from our speakers. This panel is about how we deal with the problem. Uh, you'll hear some case studies uh, and uh, you'll learn about how volunteers and community groups can work with their municipalities to, uh, to control this problem. Uh, let me just go through a few Zoom tips first. Um, Please be aware that we're recording this event and that it will be posted to our YouTube uh, channel afterwards for uh, greater public access. Um, it's also good to keep yourself mute throughout the session um, and uh, extraneous noises can be a real distraction to, to our speakers. Um, after the presentations, please stay to thank our uh, panelists and also to join in a Q&A discussion with the panel. Um, Ellen will also share some sneak peeks of upcoming events at TFN, so do stick around. Uh, to ask a question of the panel when we get to that part of the session, just write it in the chat feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And if you can't see this, the chat feature, just uh, move your window to the right a bit and it'll probably appear. And just write your question there and Ellen's going to collect those questions and uh, consolidate them and <clears throat> when we're ready uh, we'll engage the panel in discussion with uh, with the audience. So I'm really delighted to introduce today's panel. Uh, Janice Gilbert, Dr. Janice Gilbert was going to be our introductory speaker but um, she's had an emergency in her family and is unable to attend. So uh, we all wish her well, um, and we're very fortunate to have Lynn Short, uh, who is the Environmental Stewardship Coordinator at Humber College, to step in and give the uh, introductory uh, orientation to Phragmites, what it is, where it came from, why it's a problem, and so forth. Lynn teaches horticulture at Humber College, and during the summers, she works with students to control invasive plant species at the Humber Arboretum. She's also developed an innovative technique to remove uh, Phragmites without herbicides using sharpened shovel blades. And she'll talk about that in her second presentation. She'll be followed then by Nicole Carpenter, who is the science projects manager for Phragmites research at Georgian Bay Forever. Nicole holds a BA with a focus on marine and freshwater biology from the University of Guelph. Um, GBF has a very successful record tackling Phragmites for over 10 years using summer volunteers and paid summer students. 
And Nicole has been managing that program since 21, and she'll update us on new directions in that program. Uh, Jessica Arachi is a natural environmental specialist uh, at an urban forestry division at the City of Toronto. Jessica graduated from the University of Toronto with a uh, BSc in biology and environmental science and received her master's in forestry in 2012. She implements restoration and tree planting projects. She engages community groups like TFN and uh, Toronto Nature Stewards and other volunteers in hands-on stewardship in restoration sites throughout the city. And she'll tell us about what the city is uh, doing to manage uh, Fragmites. So the order of presentations, uh, Lynn is gonna give us an introduction to Phragmites, why it's a problem, how it got here, um, what we're doing about it, generally speaking. And then she will follow herself with a presentation on uh, Phragmites and how, they've, how she's developed an innovative spading technique to, uh, to deal with the problem. Nicole will then follow Lynn and talk about what Georgian Bay Forever has done to control Phragmites and uh, talk a bit about their new phase of expanding their projects uh, and scaling up their control strategies at Georgian Bay. And then Jessica will finish up with um, uh, City of Toronto and uh, to tell us about the extensive work the city has been doing with community groups to control not only Phragmites, but other invasive species as well. Okay, so we're gonna get started with Lynn and her introduction to the problem. Lynn, you want to share a screen? <clears throat> I'm sorry, I, I'm trying, but it seems to, there, is it, is it okay now? No, wrong one. Oops. There. This is the one I would like. Okay. Can you see my screen now? Yeah. You want to put it on slideshow? There you go. Got it. Okay. Sorry. I am. Um, I always get nervous. <laughs> You're doing just great. Anyway. Um, so thank you for. Uh, for welcoming me in place of Janice. I know that um, I've worked with Janice over many years and uh, she has so much to share and I'm really hoping that things will go well in her situation. I, I, my heart goes out to her. Um, so Phragmites australis is, you know, is the Latin name. It's also known as European common reed and it is quite common in Europe. And I saw it when I was there, uh, it's native there. But it, in 2005, it was identified by researchers at Agriculture and Agri-Foods Canada as Canada's worst invasive species. And uh, the photo on the right uh, just shows um, me with a volunteer and in our, uh, uh, one of our research sites, that Phragmites there was three and a half meters tall. Uh, Ingrid and I aren't very tall. So uh, it was just so remarkable. It was towering over the whole patch. So invasive Phragmites, uh, lots of people think that it's been planted along the roadsides and they think it's beautiful. Like Philip thought it was a great subject for his photography, um, but it is a non-native perennial wetland grass. That's what a reed means. It's a wetland grass. It forms really dense, basically monoculture stands and the fact that it's there it inhibits the growth of other plant species and then it doesn't support uh, other animal species native animal species so where did it come from uh, it's not native clearly uh, it must have come from somewhere and uh, it's really there's not a lot of information about how it got here uh, it definitely came from europe and asia and where it was native and was transported somehow to North America. One of the stories that I heard, which is kind of funny, is that it was called, it was referred to as elephant grass. And uh, the story is that it was brought in uh, animal bedding um, with a circus. And so, it and it was so big that they decided to call it 
animal grass. And, uh, and it was, um, it, you know, it, at the time it was, it just got started in the St. St. Lawrence River Valley about a hundred years ago. And, and then it began to move down the river. It travels along waterways. It prefers wetlands. And uh, in the 19, by the 1940s, it was identified in around Lake St. Clair and the Dor Detroit River. And it has been spreading uh, ever since then. And I think probably it's really become a, a, a major concern over the last 20, 25 years when it seems to have really uh, increased the spread it spread throughout Ontario and really it's going moving across uh, Canada and North America. And one of the facilitators is, is highway corridors. And you can see on the right, the picture, there it is growing through, that's Highway 27 near Humber College. And it's actually growing through the paved shoulder. It's, uh, it's a pretty robust plant. And uh, because highways create wind and the seeds are spread, um, like dandelions in the wind, then it's it's been easy for the plant to travel along the highway corridors, colonize the ditches, and then go beyond that into natural areas. So, um, <clears throat> you know, it's it's a green plant. Why should we control it? You can see it growing there on uh, on the left is is a beach property, and you can't really see anything else. And on the right, it's already invading somebody's waterfront on their lake property. So there are lots of reasons why it should be controlled. And Philip already mentioned, it is an ecosystem threat. It takes over wetlands uh, and it replaces native plant species. And that makes it really literally a habitat desert for native animal species that depend on those wetlands. And there have even been, uh, you know, it it's gets so thick, it's impossible to travel through. There've been lots of uh, documented cases of uh, turtle, dead turtles being found in within the within the uh, Phragmites, and there was even a, a case that I read about a dead deer. The deer got in there, got confused, nothing to eat, nothing, nowhere to go, and um, couldn't get out. Uh, it's a highway infrastructure threat. You saw the picture about how it. Um, can crumble the edge of the road, the pavement, but it also um, the ditches have to be continually dredged because it uh, blocks the drainage away from the roads, which can lead to flooding and damage. And, um, and it also, uh, it's a safety threat. It can impede the sight lines at road entrances. I was, I just traveled yesterday to Peterborough. There was a road that I was traveling on. I couldn't see the exit sign because it, the plant was so thick and so tall, it blocked my sight to see the exit uh, and I also was going through an S turn and I couldn't really see around the corner. So it can really be a, a, a safety hazard. It's also, if there's an accident uh, on the highways, I've also, from MTO, they've also reported that sometimes they have difficulty locating a victim of, a, of an accident if they're thrown from a car into the Phragmites. Uh, it's also, in terms of a safety threat, it's, when it's dry, it, you can see that it's, it's very, um, it, it remains standing even through the winter and that dry vegetation is a fire hazard, especially if it's near uh, buildings or communities or roads. And in fact, it is very resistant to decomposition, which is why it's, uh, it, it remains standing really until the next season. And uh, that was actually one of the characteristics that made it useful in Europe in the early days. It was used as, uh, as a way of thatching roofs because it was resistant to uh, decomposition. And so it was good for thatching roofs to keep the water out of the buildings, but we don't use it that way anymore. So, and it is also an economic threat. It, it really negatively impacts the property value uh, when it's colonizing, like, you know, if it's a, you know, beachfront property and you can't see the waterfront or you can't walk through it, or you can't swim in the water, if it's invaded the water, it's, it also, um, property values. Uh, who wants to buy a property that you can't see the waterfront or you can't get to the water to boat or swim? And the problem is that it is rapidly spreading in the last couple of decades. It's really rapidly spreading all around the Great Lakes and, uh, and beyond. When you do control it, 
um, it's amazing. This, uh, these photos are from my uh, research site at the beach. Um, when, I, when I was able to, I removed the Phragmites and it was amazing. The native uh, seed bank was there. The sedges, the rushes, the joe pieweed, the bonestead, the you know, bed straw, the goldenrod, everything came back. Uh, the seeds were there waiting to grow. And then the native uh, animals began to return. There was even an, uh, a day when I was actually showing the research site to a group from, from the township. And there was uh, a great blue heron came and like a young one came and landed on the site while we were all standing there. So it was a pretty exciting day. So, you know, when you do um, try to improve the, uh, the biodiversity of the plants and return it to its native state, then the animals can return. Um, and if you actually know what you're looking for, uh, you, can, you can do something about it. And I think that's one of the, one of the things that's uh, really important to think about. So you need to be able to recognize it. Uh, you can see on the left, that's the winter uh, foliage. It's dry, it's still standing. You can see in the center, the green growth in the midsummer. And on the left is the mature uh, flower heads. So it's, it grows on waterfront areas, in roadside ditches, wetlands. It's, it's very adaptable to all kinds of conditions as long as the soil is moist in some way. Um, Philip mentioned the underground root system. The thick rhizomes can go down up to 10 feet. Um, and then of course, the, it's got a kind of a blue green foliage, the stalks and the leaves. Um, so it makes it a little bit distinct from the surrounding foliage. And then of course the flowers and flowers, uh, the flowers are variable. I've never been able to figure out exactly what the reason is, but there are some that are kind of yellowish green and some that are kind of purple and some are very big plumes and some are thin, but they're all non-native Phragmites. Um, how does it spread? Oh my goodness. It's got so many survival strategies. Um, I guess you have to admire it, even though I really don't want it around. So the seed, the flowers, if they fall into the wet areas, you can see the seedlings beginning to grow from the, on the left there, top left. Uh, from the rhizomes, you get sprouts growing and roots growing. From, uh, from the, let me just, the stolons over the surface. So the rhizomes can go under the ground or in the water. Um, the stolons go over the land. They, they're quite the trip hazard if you that on, on the beach. Um, and then of course cuttings. If you cut it down and you don't um, and you, you don't remove those cuttings, they can grow wherever they land. Uh, this is one of the things that was interesting at uh, the beach where I have property on Georgian Bay. You can see the upper biomass and then the underground rhizomes that go down so far. So most of the biomass is below ground. So you gotta remember that when you're trying to, trying to get rid of it. Um, if, you know, if you recognize their, the life cycle, it is a perennial, it comes back every year, but the time, the vegetative growth and the flowering times are the ones to really uh, take note of. So you want to, um, Optimal re removal times are late July towards the end of the vegetative growth and uh, into early October. However, if it is in flower, uh, then you need to cut those off in first and uh, heat treat them in uh, sealed garbage bags before you send the flowers to the landfill because the seeds are really difficult uh, to kill. So just thinking about your timing. Sometimes it's hard to wait till July though, you wanna do it, but it's kind of like when you cut the grass and um, you know, in the spring, it keeps coming back really quickly, but later in the season, you cut it and you don't have to cut it for a couple of weeks. So it's sort of like that. It is a grass. And thinking about what you can do about it. First of all, it's so important to learn about it. Make sure, and, and whatever knowledge you have, you share with everybody. My, my neighbors and my friends are all sick of me talking about it, but I, I won't stop. Um, find out about community efforts that are going on in your own locality. Um, you know what control measures are being used in your in your municipality. Try to support conservation efforts, land trusts, 
government programs, funding partners in any way that you can. Um, if, if you feel physically uh, um, inspired, you can also get involved in removal effort, efforts. There are lots of uh, volunteer organizations that are looking for able-bodied types. And, and you know, if you wait for somebody else to do it, the plant keeps growing. And if you have a really large infestation in a community, it's really important to seek professional help. The key is don't give up. You can make a difference. So thank you very much. And I'll stop sharing. Lynn, thanks very much for that. Um, <clears throat> seems like elephant grass is an appropriate name for that, um, that read, doing my photography around the Leslie Street Spit. Sometimes you can't actually see the the cells or the ponds because the um, the grass is so tall and uh, it's amazing how big it can get. It is, um, it is, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. So we're very <laughs> fortunate that Lynn has the stamina to give us two presentations today. And um, um, Lynn is the innovator and developer of a, a technique to um, spade and control fragmites on, on land. And she developed it right in her backyard. And uh, Lynn, you're gonna tell us that story. Okay, I'll screen share and see if I can get this right this time. <clears throat> I think I might have to do something about, oh dear. I have to end this one and then find the other one. Sorry, I'm Take not your very- time. We're, we're just fine. Take your time. Um, so close that one. Okay, here we go. Um, this is my second one. Okay. Um, you know, you always say my backyard. We have this, we have this big debate since it's uh, the property is on the beach and we call it beachfront property, then we don't call that our backyard. We call that our front yard. Where the road is, that's our backyard. <laughs> so, um, so anyway, uh, I've been. Uh, the picture there is one of the stewardship volunteers that volunteers at Evergreen Brickworks with uh, at, at, uh, with the City of Toronto. It's one of the organizations that I do support uh, with workshops and uh, and just getting out there with my spade. So the beginning of my story was that it was at least 20 years ago on a beach called Wimblewood Beach. It's on Georgia Bay and the water levels were dropping. And so that was exposing more sand. And uh, there was a lot of concern about the water levels going down, but it, it meant that the beach changed and beach, beach ecosystems are, they're called dynamic ecosystems. So when the water level goes down, then the native plants colonize the beach and they hold the sand so it doesn't blow away while the water levels are low. And then of course, when the water levels, because water levels fluctuate on a beach, then when they come back up, the plants get drowned, but the seed bank remains and it waits until another uh, lowering of the water levels. So it was, it was normal to see plants growing on on the beach. And there was initially quite the biodiversity, but Sure enough, Phragmites began to take over as it does in many other places. So I, I realized that it, this wasn't supposed to happen. I wanted to see that the, the biodiversity and it was taking over. So I tried lots of approaches. First of all, I tried, you know, cutting it down and it kept growing back. And uh, my neighbor said, oh, don't worry, I have a, a line trimmer, that'll, that'll make your job easy. So I went out with his line trimmer, I broke the line three times, gave up. It was just too tough to do that. And I thought, okay, There's, I, I started cutting off the stolons because they were trip hazards for me and my husband. And, and I, I thought, okay, I have to start thinking like a plant. Um, I'm in horticulture, so there must be a way. So I thought about, okay, photosynthesis. It provides fuel for the plant growth and the development. If it can't photosynthesize, it can't turn you know, CO2 and water and sun's energy into food, and then it can't thrive. So how am I gonna do that? I thought if I cut it below the surface, nothing about the plant could see the sun. And not only that, if you're walking across the beach in your bare feet, 
um, it also made it a lot easier to walk over the beach because those uh, stalks that stick up are really, they can cut your feet. So that's what I started doing. And it's funny in horticulture, you know, it's, it, most people don't think about it, but we, we sharpen everything. Uh, we sharpen all of our tools. And so it was for me, a natural thing to sharpen a spade. Although I just, you know, we have a grinder and you just sharpen the edge of it so that when you're digging roots or you're doing anything, it just makes your job easier. You know, everybody thinks about sharpening like clippers or pruners or whatever, but we sharpen everything. So I got my sharpened spade and I realized that the plant, the stalk went down below the surface. So started cutting it below the surface. The other thing that I didn't want to do was disturb the other native plants that were there. So by placing the spade a little bit away from the base of the plant on a 45 degree angle, kicking it in, cutting, you can hear the stalk cut, and then removing it, I could do that and selectively remove the Phragmites without disturbing the soil very much. And it was interesting because uh, a lot of the, the kids that helped me in, in later years, um, they always want to use their arms and push to shovel in. And I sort of said to them, okay, which is the bigger muscle? I know you guys are all strong, but is it your arm muscle or leg muscle? And then they sort of put their head down and said, yep, the leg muscle. So kick the shovel in. Saves, you know, especially when you're doing a thousand kicks in a day. So I got students to help on the beach because uh, first I started nagging my neighbors, of course, and showing them how to do it. And then there were lots of people who bought into that. But then there were lots of people who said, I don't come up here to work and or I can't do that kind of physical labor or, you know, for whatever excuse. And, and I thought, oh, well, there are lots of kids at the beach who come up with their family and <clears throat> uh, I could get them to work for a few hours in the morning where it's not when it's not too hot. And then they can hang out at the beach all afternoon, but they'd have some money to spend because the residents were quite happy to pay them to do that. And so that's what we did. So um, I'm happy to say at the beach now, there is pretty well no Phragmites left except for a few remnant populations at public access points. So it's, you know, over 20 years. And so we, and then th these, this is a public access point here. And there was a lot of Phragmites that was contributing to this continued uh, persistence of the plant. So we just got a team of people and, you know, who were concerned about it. And we were able, we got support from the municipality. They provided us with the bags and they took them away for us. And we were able to, that, that area is now primarily a cleared area with just native species. Um, this is a beach that, uh, Many, uh, many years ago, uh, very first about, you know, probably 15 years ago, uh, one of the neighbors had a terrible infestation. It was so wet and they had like a little wooden, um, like almost a, like a little pathway through a corn maze, but was all Phragmites. And she was like ready to sell the cottage because she just thought it was hopeless. And uh, I said, no, I think we can, we can try. And uh, after five years, her beach was rushes, sedges, willows, cattails, you know, it was just amazing. And it's a lovely beach right now. And native species, and she gets butterflies, and she has frogs in the wet areas. It's just a great place. So then I thought, okay, if I'm going to tell people this is going to work, I better, you know, put my money where my mouth is. And uh, I got to do some research and get some data. Because, in, you know, most people, they, they don't really believe you unless you have scientific data. So you got to speak the language. So I, I set up two test sites, one at Humber, Humber Arboretum and one at Wimblewood Beach and showed that within four years, a patch that was virtually all Phragmites could be uh, very, very much under control with only a few plants left and lots of native species. So, um, that everybody was encouraged with that. I know Jessica is going to talk about a group that I worked with at one of her parks. So then as I, you know, when I worked at, uh, you know, since I had that, that under my belt, I had that proof. Uh, we've been using that spading technique at the Humber Arboretum. Uh, this is a 
rest, uh, restored pond, TRCA did some restoration. There was Phragmites around it. So for the last three years, we've been controlling it and the cattails are really taking over and the native species. So it's it, we're, we're well under our weight. We've got three years on our belt. We'll need a few more years to get it really under control, but they're, the population is very much diminished, diminished now. And then this is another, um, so the, one of the things when I, when I met Janice, actually Janice was one that, you know, kind of inspired me to do research and, and to travel around. And so I've gone in many places uh, just to do workshops with people, hands-on workshops. So Cherry Beach was one of them. And uh, Anna Ho, she sent me these pictures. So this is at Cherry Beach in Toronto. In 2021, I went down, I did a hands-on workshop. I showed them how to do it. At the time, there was about 80% coverage of Phragmites at this particular small test site. It took them 30 hours to clear. The next year, the test site, it was already uh, you know, a lot under control, 10% coverage, took them three hours to clear the same test site. So that's the, that's the thing is the, you, every year it gets easier and easier. And then you can just expand your area of control. And then by the fall of 2022, they went back and there was only 1% coverage of Phragmites and it only took them less than half an hour to clear. So this, uh, it, you know, it, when Anna found out that uh, from the Toronto Nature Stewards, she's the one of the leads, she, uh, when she found out that I was doing this uh, presentation, she, without me asking, sent me those photos to just show uh, that you can make a difference. And uh, so she sent me the photos I include, she knows I'm, I've included them in this presentation. So they're volunteer, uh, they're really dedicated volunteers and they continue that, that work. So community efforts can really make a difference. So, and, and that's the end of my presentation. So thank you very much. Philip. Yeah, sorry about that. Thanks very much, Lynn. That was great. Um, takeaways for me are uh, certainly how young people with their energy and enthusiasm can play a very important role in Phragmites control, <laughs> particularly if you pay them during the summer if they don't have another summer job. Um, yes. Yeah. And also the <laughs> importance of community involving the community and what the neighbors can see if they can see you're doing it then they they get converted as well it's classic that's, market transformation um, that's that's activity. really what happened on our beach there were lots of yep. people who said oh why should i bother and then um actually the the last one i've been working on the last two years was was a, one of the last holdouts and he emailed me two years ago and said is there any way the kids could help me with my phragmites um you know i i I think it's time. And so the last two years we've been working on that as well. Right. And, and you're right. I think peer pressure gets to them, you know. Great. Okay, we're gonna to go to our next presentation. Nicole Carpenter from uh from Georgian Bay Forever is going to tell us about their work. They've been planning, mapping, controlling Phragmites, uh using cut and drown methods for I think almost 10 years, is it Nicole? And yep. they've had a lot of success and they've moved into a whole new phase with their success. And Nicole's gonna tell us a little bit about the history of that and um, where they're going from here. Okay, Nicole, you can share the screen. Great, thank you. Okay, um, all right. Uh, does it look good, Philip? Can you see everything? Looks great, yeah. Awesome. All right, hello, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Nicole and I'm the Science Projects Manager for Georgian Bay Forever. And uh, like Philip said, I'm gonna be talking about our long running invasive Phragmites program uh, that is focused on the, uh, more so the Southeastern Georgian Bay uh, coast, but really all of uh, Georgian Bay itself. Uh, and yes, it's been running for about 10 years now. I've been with the organization for, this will be my third summer season. So I'm gonna do my best to sort of recap everything from before I was around and update on sort of what's going on now. Georgian Bay Forever, for those of you that don't know, is a charity dedicated to scientific research and public education on Georgian Bay's aquatic ecosystems. 
Our mission is to protect, enhance, and restore the aquatic ecosystem of Georgia Bay by taking action and funding accredited research on water levels, water quality, and ecosystems. So um, 10 years ago, when we started working with uh, Collingwood and the Nottawasaga Valley Conservation Authority, they had a really large, large patch on the West Collingwood shoreline. And this was sort of our introduction to invasive Phragmites and um, us along with uh, the NVCA and some community groups were looking for funding to uh, get some resources uh, and work with the community to tackle this patch on the beach. Kind of starting there and uh, the following three or four years, we really became increasingly aware of the need for Phragmites education and control across Georgia Bay. So we started spreading aware awareness, um, hosting training workshops and actively cutting with communities all over uh, from Tobermory down to Collingwood across to Honey Harbor and then all up the eastern shoreline throughout areas like Point of Barrel uh, and even as far north as Manitoulin Island. In 2019, we developed a five-year community-based uh, control program that was for around 600 stands that were identified along the coasts of three municipalities in southeastern Georgian Bay. And one of the main goals with this program, uh, which we are currently still involved in, is to confidently leave the responsibility of Phragmites control and monitoring to communities, which leads to a sustainable method of environmental management, and in this case, um, invasive Phragmites control. So I'm just going to go through a few, um, well, seven key components that have led to this program uh, being quite successful. So number one, planning. Uh, this is really important to ensure a successful program, one must be prepared to make changes and be flexible and securing resources. Uh, so this is specific for things like funding for staff and equipment, um, but this does continue to be a challenge for all organizations, big or small. These two things can occur in the winter and the spring. Um, so we're doing this right around now. Um, our team is planning for the next season and uh, applying to funding to help continue our program. Uh, then as summer starts to approach, we can start doing our yearly mapping. And this is important so you know what you're dealing with uh, coming into your summer control. So like Lynn said, uh, we're not controlling until um, kind of later July and, and following that. So um, we usually start mapping in June. And this is when the plant has sort of grown to a point where um, us and our volunteers and our staff are able to identify it from a common grass. It's a little bit easier at this time of year to, to identify it. So this allows for early detection, making sure any new growth is controlled immediately before getting out of hand. And we're, um, we're recording things like size, density, we're taking photos of the sites, uh, looking at the hydrologic condition, um, and taking any other relative notes that will be um, relatable to the individual site plans. So depending on site conditions, we might just need uh, hand tools. Um, there might be a different technique involved, whether it's the spading or the cut to drown, which I'm gonna talk about in a minute, um, or we, we might need some heavier machinery uh, to, to get involved in the control. This plan is then executed, uh, like we talked about already uh, during the summer. And for us, it's our staff, our volunteers, and our partners physically in the water controlling the Phragmites. <clears throat> Looking back on your program and establishing what worked and what could change allows for growth in a program and strength for the following year. So this is really important. In the fall, we look back at everything um, that was good and bad about the year and we can modify our plan for next year. And then lastly, commitment. This is a all year round part of the project. Uh, Fragmites control really does take time and dedication, but um, we are dedicated to reaching our, our goal. So we predominantly use the manual cut to drown method. Um, we do not do any herbicide application, though that is uh, an option in some cases. And we do some spading when needed. So spading is often more so used for a terrestrial site while cut to drown is used for aquatic uh, growth. <clears throat> so I'm just going to talk about how the cut to drown method works. 
we use a tool called a raspberry cane cutter and this can be purchased from lee valley um, there might be some other places we get it from lee valley uh, it's not too expensive and um, it's basically a sharp tool with a, a bit of a hook and uh, we use this to cut the Phragmite stock. We can be selective so you're only cutting Phragmite, you're not cutting the native vegetation um, and you're cutting it below the water uh, as close to the sediment as possible and um, you're removing the stock and the water basically fills up what is a hollow root system and uh, this is basically where it gets its name cut to drown. In a, a very large, dense monoculture site, we can use something called a long reach hedge trimmer. This is a more expensive uh, tool, but uh, it works really well for larger, dense stands where you're not worried about uh, you know, cutting any native vegetation that could be mixed in there. And I'm not gonna talk about the timing too much because we've done that already. So July through August, uh, we like to do it before the seeds develop um, you know so you're not shaking the plant around and uh, spreading the seed but sometimes seeds do develop earlier than expected um, or we are working later into the season so um, you can just be careful when you're cutting and we can specifically uh, we'll dedicate someone to removing uh, the seed heads from the plant but if people have questions about that uh, we can talk about it in the q a um, we also then dispose of the cut biomass by bundling it with organic twine and we, we actually often leave it on site because we're working in a lot of remote locations and we leave it in a high dry location where the Phragmites can sort of sit in the sun and, uh, and rot out and decompose. We do check these sites every year to ensure there's no regrowth, um, uh, both the cutting site and the disposal site. Resources that are important to the success of this program are tools, like I mentioned. Uh, these can be purchased and they can be shared amongst your group and uh, with other groups as well. So we have, uh, we, you know, we let volunteers use them. We have kind of like a little, you can have like a rental program, things like that for tools. Um, having community group leaders uh, is also great. This is someone that can be a main contact to help keep track of volunteers, progress, uh, and things like that. Uh, partnerships are really, really important. Collaboration is key to successful invasive species management. And lastly, learning from one another to see how we can adapt our program and share ideas. I mentioned earlier how a plan must be flexible due to unforeseen circumstances, which could alter site plans. So Lynn talked about water levels a little bit. Um, I'm going to go into a bit more detail about it, but um, like she said, in Georgian Bay, we, we have fluctuating water levels, which are normal. Um, some I won't go into too much detail about that, but any aquatic ecosystem really, especially big lakes like the Great Lakes, we do see fluctuating water levels. Um, and this is a challenge to our program uh, because Phragmites grows along shallow wetlands. So if the waters, if the water levels rise or drop even just a few inches, um, this can change the hydrologic condition which in turn will change the removal technique that you'll be using. So it could go from a, an aquatic site using cut to drown to a terrestrial site needing spading. And that's what we're, we're kind of seeing because right now the water levels are a bit lower. Um, so that does pose a challenge to our, our control plan. <clears throat> so uh, this past year, like I said, the water levels were down and we found the sites being more terrestrial. With higher water levels, we find the cut to drown method much more effective, uh, simply because those roots have a harder time getting sunlight and oxygen. Um, a couple of years ago, we had pretty high water levels in, in Georgia Bay, and we saw a lot of our sites actually get put into what we call an uneradicated state, uh, where uh, this, or you could say controlled, where we're seeing zero regrowth at a site. Um, and this was because of those high water levels. But the following year, the water levels dropped. And when we returned to this site, we actually found a couple new stocks sprouting up again. So even though we're seeing zero regrowth, we want to keep checking those sites, especially with such a dynamic uh, ecosystem that is changing from year to year. A large part of this plan has also been to offer uh, employment to local summer students each year to assist in our program. Each year, we've been lucky enough to receive generous support from the local municipalities and cottage associations to aid in hiring summer staff responsible for the mapping, removal, and monitoring of invasive Phragmites, as well as hosting and attending events to spread education and awareness. 
so these charts here demonstrate our success. So um, each color represents a different level of treatment. Red is sites left untreated, yellow are sites cut, and green are sites that are in those monitoring uh, eradicated stage. And you'll see each year we've increased the whole the total number of stands that we are uh, managing, but we're also increasing that green and yellow slice. So showing more control over the year, over the years. And this is uh, really due to um, the, uh, the dedication of our local community members. So we're seeing plenty of control, for example, in uh, the township of Georgian Bay and North. And these areas are nearly 100% community led, which is fantastic. And um, the dedication of these communities and persistency to monitor and remove invasive phragmites each year has been uh, has just been fantastic. So this has allowed us to relocate our efforts further south and work with communities that have a high density and high number of stands um, in within their community. And then uh, what we do is we help these communities sort of uh, get to a point where it can be manageable by uh, volunteers and um, and then no longer need our help anymore. So going forward, one thing that we want to start doing a little bit more uh, in our organization is encouraging province-wide coordination, uh, getting access to more funding for organizations and groups to incorporate invasive phragmites um, roadside management, which as Lynn talked about, roadsides are a major travel vector for phragmites. So uh, enhancing that control um, <clears throat> is much needed across the province. And I just, uh, through my contact information up here, I'm sure um, it'll get shared later, but if anyone has any uh, questions after the, the conference, this is, or after the panel, sorry, um, you can reach out to me if you have any questions. Oh, Phil, you're muted again. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thanks very much for that, Nicole. Um, what an impressive record that, um, Georgian Bay Forever has with uh, these control strategies. I think the takeaway for me is that it, it's more than just going out and cutting stuff there. It has to involve an overall strategy, planning, mapping, uh, recruitment of partners, community involvement, funding, if one can find it. So it, it's, uh, you mentioned your five-year plan. It's, uh, it's a long-term process and uh, something you can't just do in the spur of the moment. So thank you very much for that. No, you want to mute it. Our next speaker is uh, Jessica, and um, Jessica is going to tell us about the work that the City of Toronto has been doing to manage and control uh, Phragmites in, in Toronto. And she's not just responsible for Phragmites. There are a lot of other invasive species, <laughs> Jessica, that you have to worry about. So this is just one thing on your plate. But thanks very much for being with us. Okay, thank you. Can everyone... See this? Looks good. Okay. Looks, looks good. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> oh my goodness. I'm very excited after hearing those presentations. Um, I really want a Georgian Bay or a Toronto Forever group um, in Toronto because I love that very unique focus on one invasive species. Um, and um, I also can say that I'm a huge fan, obviously, of Lynn's work. We've been working with her for a while, so um, I'm really happy to be here with everybody. Clearly, um, a really um, a topic that a lot of people are interested in. Um, Jessica, Jessica, um, your your uh, audio is a little funny. I wonder if there's something lying on your okay. computer. Is this any better? Much better. Thank you. Okay. So sorry. Okay, well, if anyone couldn't hear me, I was just singing glowing praises for Nicole and Lynn's work, and I'm very excited um, to hear more from them. But um, today, I will be talking about sort of the city's efforts in invasive species control um, and, uh, and what we've been doing with Phragmites. Um, I am uh, with Urban Forestry, I'm the Natural Environment Specialist. I'm also on the board of TFM, um, just for full disclosure, but um, I'm wearing, I'm fully wearing my city hat today. So just very briefly, I'm sure a lot of you have already seen this map. Um, 
it's showing the the land area covered by parklands, ravines, um, environmentally significant areas in orange. Uh, and I really wanted to just um, highlight the fact that Toronto is extremely lucky. Lucky we um, the city doesn't do a good enough job to to say how impressive our ravine system is. Just to give you a sense. Um, it's about 30 times the size of New York City Central Park, and everyone knows about Central Park, but not many people know about this world-class um, group of habitat that we have in Toronto. So it makes up about 17% of Toronto's land area. We have 11,000 hectares that we're managing. 40% of that is on private land, so that you know that's an added sort of level of of uh, management. Um, and we are managing about 40 invasive species. Um, the worst one for us, um, I would say, is probably buckthorn. Um, not to say Phragmites is, is not completely horrible, because it certainly is. Um, but I just wanted to highlight the fact that, you know, we have a lot of, um, a lot of pressures on the system. And so balancing those priorities is always a challenge. So um, at this moment, we're investing about $2.6 million in invasive management across the city. And um, every budget year, um, we are always asking for more resources to do this work um, because people are sort of cluing into what an invasive species is. I think I heard the mayor say invasive species for the first time last year. So it's getting into the public consciousness, which is great. And I wanted to highlight um, sort of who is involved in invasive management within the city, because people may not be well aware of, of who is doing what. I know that can be um, often very confusing. Um, we have about 14 city staff that work um, throughout the city. Um, uh, Jessica. Jessica, yep. still, um, there's a the 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 audio is going in and out. Perhaps there's. Oh, sorry. Okay, it, let me try to sit closer. <laughs> may that would help. Yeah. Okay. 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 Um. Yes. Please feel free to keep talking to me if I'm not clear. Sorry about that. So, um, I was just saying that um, I wanted to go over the who's involved in invasive management. I know that can be a bit confusing for folks. Uh, so we have about 14 city staff dedicated to invasive management. Um, so they're the ones who are using herbicides. They also use mechanical removals. Um, and their focus is largely within ESAs. So we like to protect the highest quality habitats first and then work out from there. Um, the TRCA, so the Toronto Region Conservation Authority, um, they, they largely own a lot of the ravine space, but the city of Toronto manages these areas. However, they do have property where they uh, own and manage. Um, so like Tommy Thompson Park, um, for example. So TRCA will do some management. Um, and between city staff and TRCA, we're working sort of on low or medium size infestation. If we have very large infestations, this is when we will hire city contractors to come in. So uh, private companies, or in some cases, the TRCA will hire them to do very heavy infestations. And they'll do this citywide. Um, for example, Bear Hill Park is a new park that was uh, built on a, uh, a landfill. There was a, a very large, uh, population of Phragmites there, and we got the contractor to come out and um, use um, herbicide on that. Uh, the public is very much involved, as we have, have heard, and I will talk more about how the public can get more involved. Um, so we have volunteer programming, um, and also, as I said, 40% of uh, ravines are on uh, private property, so people are managing these things on their own property as well. And usually the public um, can tackle sort of lower, uh, smaller infestations of invasive. Uh, and then we have various partners throughout the city, um, Humber Arboretum, um, Toronto Botanical Gardens, to name a few. Uh, TFN, of course, is, is doing management uh, in, in certain areas. So we partner with folks to do invasive management as well. So, um, as I mentioned, I want to talk about the volunteer programs that we run. Um, this is a place where the public can really get involved and make a huge difference. Um, so we engage the community to protect, restore, and enhance features and functions in the natural environment. And we have a lot of different ways that people can get involved. We have, if you want to just do a small commitment, you want to come out for two hours, 
Um, we have various tree planting and stewardship events across the city. Um, we also do education and outreach, um, which is very important because again, not many people know about invasive species, so we'll do workshops and presentations and walks and talks to help people understand um, why this is important. And then what I'm really gonna be focusing on today is the community stewardship program. So this is really long-term restoration um, in sites. So we have eight sites currently, and we've been working on them for 20 years. So this is where you can really get a lot of um, uh, restoration work done, because as you've heard in other presentations, you really have to be present on these sites for the long-term if you wanna do the best uh, work that you can do. So I'm gonna go through two case studies just to show sort of how um, effective we've been, especially with Phragmites. Um, and this is within our community stewardship program. Um, actually, that's a photo of Lynn there. She was not by herself. We did not her put her solely to work on our Phragmites patch. There were other volunteers there, but I just love that photo of, of Lynn because she is one of the hardest working people I've ever seen. Um, so first I wanted to talk about uh, Milne Hollow, and this is the case where it is the most effective mechanical removal of uh, Phragmites I've ever seen. Um, we've been working on this site for over 20 years, um, and we have a patch of about 300 um, square meters of Phragmites there. It's, it was complete monoculture. Um, and up until we actually met Lynn, we didn't really have an effective manual technique for eradicating this patch. So we were doing a lot of cutting of seed heads or just cutting the sock, but it wasn't very effective. And we wanna be very sure to use our volunteers time like well, we do a lot of planning to make sure that um, you know all the priorities in the site are met because we don't just have fragmented on these sites, we have buckthorn, DSV, lots of other things. So we're just careful about how we use our time. Um, so in 2016, I guess this is right around when Lynn was starting her, her research, I'm not even sure how I found her, but her name was really getting out there. And so I invited Lynn to come out and do a workshop for volunteers um, on this new spading technique I heard about. So within the, the city, we're, like, I'm very open to um, hearing various techniques. Um, I always want to know what the best research is out there, so I'm always looking for it. Um, and so she, Lynn graciously agreed to do a workshop with our volunteers. And so from 2016 onwards, we incorporated um, this spading technique. So in this case, um, uh, I would say that we would normally focus from July um, until August, so before the seed had come out. But we had, um, in particular, volunteers who made Phragmites their enemy number one. and insisted on cutting any um, shoot that came out at any time of year. And so at first I was trying to like push them toward, you know, let's, our priorities are really, you know, let's do July to August. No, nope, this is what I'm going to do with my time here. And um, and they did that and that's fine because, uh, you know, as, as long as you're, you're doing the technique and you're doing it over and over again and you are dedicated to doing that that way, it actually ended up working out well. Um, we have to remove the material from our site um, in most cases because we're in very, uh, we're in Toronto and so you can't just um, store your waste on site because there's, you know, thousands of people coming by and then they'll get quite upset about that. So um, you'll notice this is standing water, so we will cut to drown in some cases. Um, and uh, we did leave some thatch on the ground and usually uh, that doesn't decompose, but in this case, it was wet enough that um, that material ended up breaking down. So, um, so here is what the patch looked like in 2015. This is when we were just cutting the seed heads. Um, it might be a little bit hard to see, but um, it is essentially an entire monoculture of uh, Phragmites. And after about four or five years, this is what this patch looks like now. You can see um, uh, cattails, native cattails have, are now dominating. Um, as Lynn mentioned, there was already a seed bank um, present. And so we saw just a wild growth of lots of other native species, asters and goldenrod. And it was quite amazing. Um, I also want to quickly note that 
um, in conjunction with uh, partnering with Lynn, we also partnered with um, a citizen science group called EcoSpark that help us, helped us collect data to ensure that the work we were doing was the best way we can manage these sites. So if anyone is interested, I would suggest reading um, that report on EcoSpark's website it's called Managing Site Manager so Policy. So I see I have two minutes left, so I'm going to try to go much faster. Um, so next I wanted to mention Riverdale Park East. Um, again, this is a community stewardship program site. Uh, we've been working in here for uh, over 20 years. Um, this is around Broadview and Girard. And we had a much bigger patch of Phragmites here, so 2,500 meters squared. Um, within the city, we try to use herbicides sparingly. So our first method will always be mechanical removal. So in this case, again, we had about um, you know 15 to 20 volunteers. Uh, we use the spading technique here for um, about two to three years, but we found that um, the patch was just too large and volunteers were getting frustrated. Um, again, these are volunteers, these are not, uh, these people are not being paid, so they are very dedicated. However, when you have so many other priorities on site, um, there can be frustration in that they wanted to get to these other priorities. And, you know, spading is, is quite labor intensive. So what we ended up doing here is um, this patch of Phragmites is not in standing water. It's nowhere near standing water because uh, Riverdale Park East is a landfill. And so there just happened to be a patch of water underground that the Phrag was tapping into. So I was able to contract the TRCA to do an herbicide treatment here of this patch. So the volunteers faded for um, two to three years and then we had it sprayed. Um, and so this year now, uh, this spray is about 90% effective and now the volunteers will be going in this year to plant it. So I'm gonna, sorry, go very quickly, Philip. I know I'm using up my time. I can talk about this stuff forever. Um, I just wanted to quickly note the challenges and what I see as the solutions. Um, as I mentioned, we have a lot of um, land to manage in Toronto. Um, and, uh, and so that requires a lot of resources. We have a lot of tools at our disposal that are scalable, um, but I will always tell people that if you want more done, you have to, to advocate for it. We also have a lot of different priorities. As I mentioned, we have many different invasive species that we're trying to balance them. And as well, um, we really focus our attention in high quality habitats like the ESAs. Um, and uh, equity of uh, volunteer opportunities is also very important to us. So we are trying to go into more underserved neighborhoods um, and you know, engage with communities that aren't normally engaged with. So um, this leaves a lot of gaps in terms of like, we have a lot of space in Toronto that aren't ESAs, for example. So um, to that point, I would say incorporating as many management techniques mm -hmm and tools as possible if necessary. Um, and then finally, choosing the best management tool for the space. Um, like I said, with Milne Hollow, um, mechanical technique worked really well, but it didn't work so well in Riverdale. So we had to use the best tool for the area, um, diversify the activities for the volunteers, um, and diversify the um, number of management tools that we have at our disposal to make restoration much easier. Okay, so uh, yeah, if anyone wants to know more, um, I would love, I always love talking about this stuff. Obviously, I'm well over my time. So uh, if you want to get in touch um, or know more about the volunteer programs that are available in the city, please contact <clears throat> us at Green Toronto at toronto.ca um, or go to our website. <clears throat> okay, sorry. Great. For, uh, <laughs> Jessica, thanks very much. And also, thanks very much for controlling that patch uh, in Riverdale Park East. My I used to live literally just a hundred yards from there. So it's great to see you guys working there. Well, I, guess my, yeah. I guess, yeah, I guess my takeaway is um, match the patch. In other words, you really need to have the right tools and strategy for each patch given its size. And um, so it, I think it really requires municipal cooperation and collaboration with the community groups to make sure that um, everything is gonna work properly. Otherwise we're all gonna get very frustrated 
um, if we don't work together on this. So thank you all very much. Those presentations were really great. And now we will move into uh, the Q&A period of our session. And I thought we could just start it out with the panel discussing among themselves a little bit. And um, I recall, Jessica, you had some questions about uh, some things that Nicole was doing. Do you want to pose your question? And we'll see if the, the panel gets, uh, gets into that particular issue. Yeah, so like I said, we find uh, within the city, we find it challenging to um, focus on one invasive species because we're, we have priorities um, with a lot of them. But in, in our, our, where we have challenges that we have a certain number of staff to do all of this work. So the city is really moving toward funding organizations to, to do this um, work, so nonprofits. Um, and so the work that Jordan Day Forever is doing is really interesting to me because it's filling uh, a gap that the city has. And so I'm curious, and Glenn, you might uh, maybe have some experience with this as well, but working with the municipality, did you find it um, challenging? Were they really welcoming to, to um, the work that you were doing in terms of funding? Because I think the city is now on the cusp of really like starting to invest more in, in groups like yours. Um, yeah, so I would say, um every municipality is different, um, but uh, we do, we have had uh, a lot of great support from municipalities. We have approached municipalities before um, requesting funding and not received it. Uh, others we have gone to and we have received what we've asked for um, or more. So it, it totally depends on the municipality. I, I think that um, with, now that we have been doing this for so long, approaching a municipality with the success that we have had uh, is definitely a benefit. At the beginning, it, it was it was hard, but having the community members and um, the citizens of that municipality um, also passionate about uh, wanting to address the issue was really important. Um, so our role kind of before you know, getting that funding from the municipality was spreading education and awareness across um, the community and um, sort of raising that awareness for the need of Frank Miney's control. Um, I will say just in the, the students that we hire are predominantly funded through the municipalities, but we do get other sources of funding. Um, so things like Canada Summer Jobs, um, even some of our own dollars uh, as part of the, the organization. So uh, we're, and cottage associations. So, uh, or community groups that if they have received um, funding from whatever, <laughs> however they've gotten, uh, gotten it, they've put it towards us to help hire a local student Often it's been, it sort of started off as cottagers in the area that had um, kids that needed a summer job and things like that. So anyway, I don't wanna go into it too far, but um, that's sort of how it started. And then um, the municipalities saw great feedback and great results from that. So uh, it's been a challenge, but yeah. If you ever want to expand into to Toronto, <laughs> I think we will very much welcome it. <laughs> That would be great. We, but we have a lot, lots to uh, deal with in Georgia Bay itself. So maybe, maybe one day. <laughs> Lynn, do you have any comments on their uh, their exchange? Well, my experience with um, with students, both college students and high school students, is that um, one of the things that like so for the high school students, some of the community efforts that we've done, we've also also offered uh, volunteer hours. So I've signed mm -hmm. for their because they're required to do, I think it's 40 volunteer hours. So I've signed the forms for them to, you know, count the, the community efforts when they're not being paid <clears throat> towards their volunteer hours, which is another great way to motivate them. But it's interesting because I think that once uh, the students uh, start working on that, they feel such a sense of empowerment. And some, some of them, it's really hard to get them to stop. <laughs> you know, just, just one more. Can we just take out one more? And same with the, stu the stewardship volunteers. Like, you know, you get going, you're on a roll and you want to, I'll just want to clear this patch or this section. And, uh, and, and once, once they, and the other thing is, 
that one of the rewards of doing this kind of work is that you actually start to look at the environment closely and you see things that you would not normally see. So I've had students where I had one guy, he didn't want to, you know, he really didn't want to get up early in the morning because I started eight in the morning and, but his mom made him go out there and, you know, with me and, um, but then he's, we saw a couple of things. We saw one of my favorite bugs, which is an ambush bug. We won't go there, but I'll, you know, look it up. Um, anyway, we saw that we saw, um, a water snake, um, you know, and then all of a sudden his eyes were opened and, and he wanted to be there. And, you know, it was, I think that, you know, that's to me, one of the, one of the advantages of doing this kind of work is, you know, if you go for a walk in the forest, you see green, but when you're actually digging and working and close up, you see things that you would not normally see. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there are more rewards than just getting paid sometimes. Right. So Lynn, what you're really saying is that just doing something very specific as a volunteer or a paid student uh, to control frag mines is almost like a portal into a wider perspective on nature. So it, it kind of pulls you in and then you can experience nature in a wider way, not just as a, uh, you know, an arduous uh, job. Yeah, they st really start to see how everything is interconnected. Right, that's great. Well, that's a really good message to, uh, to send to uh, our wider community here. Um, I'm now gonna turn the session over to Ellen, who has been very dutifully collecting uh your many uh questions and uh, ellen has a very uh difficult job of trying to consolidate all that and uh, raise some questions with you so ellen i'll i'll go over to you now yeah thank you thank you philip and thank you to the whole panel it's been a really lively discussion on chat which is wonderful to see and people have been answering each other's questions um and and there's a lot of enthusiasm and i think the fact that you were you you were pointing out that native plants will come back that the seed bank is there i think that is also inspiring so there's been for example there's been conversation about what kind of tools do i use so the it's the how to kinds of questions um and uh and and some of those have been answered um there's definitely been questions about what groups can i go to and i i just want to emphasize that uh in in the toronto area the 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 toronto nature stewards check that out on the website on their website and there are opportunities to sign up and their website is is up to date and and very useful also ecospark uh in in the toronto area lynn lynn short has recommended that so so those are uh opportunities and then of course as jessica mentioned in the toronto area um you, there are the city of toronto also hosts um these pop up or drop in volunteer opportunities that include Phragmites. So, so you'll find more information in the chat, but, but that was that information. Um, there has also been a conversation about um, what does eradicated mean? And there's you know, a concern about the seed source. Uh, so how, um, how long do the seeds live in the ground? And, and when you say eradicated, uh, does that mean forever? Or, and I wonder any of the panel, if you have advice on, on that sort of very fundamental question. I can uh, start just to the, that word eradicated. I feel like I was the one that used that. So I'll just give a quick um, term. And when, when we use, this is just a term that we use to, um, to say zero regrowth. So, um, but we kind of have changed our terminology a little bit. Uh, I was talking about those changes in water levels and the sites growing, mm -hmm. growing back sometimes. So it's, we kind of um, monitoring, I would say is a better term or controlled, but um, uh, we like to monitor a site that has had zero regrowth for about two or three years. And when I say monitoring, it's just going and checking it in July and August see if there's any stalks that have re-sprouted. If there's one or two, then you're there, you can remove it. Um, you often won't go back. It's not like you're gonna go back and see a huge 10 hectare dense site come back um, out of nowhere, but um, that's the, that terminology, but it's really important to continue uh, monitoring it. Um, and then after a couple of years, no, no regrowth seen, then you can stop uh, you know, going back to that site and checking it. But I might 
hand it over to someone else to talk about the seed. Um, uh, uh, yeah, Lynn, can you, can you take that? Yeah, why don't you? Yeah, um, go ahead. Yeah, so um, that's that's why. So on the on the beach that I'm talking about, Wimblewood Beach. That's my you know my personal experience is that it took me about five years to to eradicate or get rid of the uh, the Phragmites, and it was interesting because uh, the water levels continued to change a little bit, and it did expose some of the rhizomes that had been underneath the so underneath the sand uh, from where the patch had been. And it was interesting because the rhizomes that were exposed were um, they were they were rotted like the, the outside skin was still there, but the inside so they were they were they had dis dissolved under the soil under the sand. But um, so over the last fifteen years, I go down there, you know, every year, and I check, and I think that monitoring is absolutely crucial because the seed source is so. Uh, predominant in surrounding areas. So you can never, it's, you know, it's a little bit like my front lawn, I try to keep the, in Toronto, I try to keep the dandelions out of my front lawn, but I'm across the road from a park and it's like a dandelion farm over there. So, uh, you know, it's, there's always, I get rid of them all, but then the next year, there's always more that come back that I have to deal with. And it's the same with Phragmites. So I think, I think the, the goal is to get to the point where the, the monoculture is under control and then be vigilant in years coming up after that to make sure that if a seedling comes in because they can multiply very quickly i know there was a researcher that i got to know through university of waterloo who brought in a, a little seedling and within uh the summer season was growing it in you know controlled situations so it wasn't um and quality soil it went from a single seedling to 60 sprouts in one season in the greenhouse in perfect conditions. But that just gives you an idea of how quickly this plant can multiply if you close your eyes and, and walk away. So, um, so I think, uh, and then as far as the seed source, it's interesting, each of those seed heads produces about, like about the flower heads produce about, you know, 500 to 1000 seeds wow. in one seed head. Now they're only, most of the indications are that they're only about 10% viable, which means, so you only, you know, out of, out of a thousand seeds, you know, there might be only a hundred seeds that, that grow. However, think about how many seed heads there are in a patch along the side of the highway. And now you multiply that by hundreds and you have thousands of seeds floating around. So I think, um, and I, I feel like, if you get to the point where you've got that control, then it is so easy to take out a few that reappear and, but never walk away and think that they're all going to go away. I mean, just right. like the dandelion <laughs> on my lawn or yeah. you know, any other pest that you have. Right. There's, it's too great an area with that potential for seeds. Right. But if you can keep those, those few that are coming out of there, like get, get them out of there, then the other, other plants that belong there can continue to thrive. And, right. and that's the goal. I, I have to say- um, just... Yeah, let me, um, having been a bureaucrat myself, I, I know they're very good at defining terms. So Jessica, how how do you, how do the bureaucrats <laughs> in the city of Toronto yeah. define what eradication I means? Realized, you... I realized that I didn't explain that I had an asterisk next to um, my eradicated, uh, um, point. Um, I would agree with Nicole and Lynn in that. Um, I would never say anything is ever eradicated in the city of Toronto. Um, people often get mad at us to say like nature should take its own course in the city, but human beings are present and nature is really good at what it does, but we have to give it the space to do that. Right. And um, so what we mean by eradicated is that uh, Lynn showed that great photo of just like a few stalks being yeah. cut when it's basically controlled. And so that's what we do on our sites is it always comes back. I think the seeds have a viability of right. you know, decades and decades. So um, that is why we are on our sites um, indefinitely because uh, you can't really ever get, especially in Toronto, um, uh, a restoration to a place. Right. Um, 
when it's already been disturbed to get it back to a pristine state. You always right. have to do some intervention. Right. Yeah. A bit like in controlling a persistent rash on your body, you just keep applying <laughs> sob until you get it down to a small yeah. patch. Yeah. Um, Ellen, do you uh, can you do you have any other questions sure. that you posed sure. from there's, the chats? There's comments in the in the chat. Um, there were early earlier on regarding um, the type of ground where spading works, and it was pointed out that spading uh, works well in clay or in sand, but that there are areas in the Georgian Bay area where you've got rock underneath, and of course there it's very difficult. So of course the 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 uh, techniques you use, they have to be fine-tuned for, for the kind of ground you've got as, as well as other features. Um, here was a question. Um, uh, are there any native insects that use Phragmites um, that people know about? Uh, do they use it a little bit? Like, is there, I guess the whole bigger question of, you know, is there a biological control that's just around the corner? Can I answer to that? Can I? Well, no, please go. Go ahead, Lynn. Yeah, there is some. So there is a lot of research being uh, put forth to try and uh, identify biological controls. And in fact, that's one of the success stories with purple loosestrife. It was taking over, but then they were able to locate biological controls that were also non-native from the area where the loosestrife was from that were uh, that specifically uh, fed on purple loosestrife. So when you have a biological control, it's just, it's exactly that. It's a control. It's not, it's not, an, it's never going to eradicate the situation, but it's going to keep the plant in check. And with Phragmites, uh, there is a, a stem boring moth and uh, it is actually already present in the GTA, in the Evergreen Brickworks and in my site on Harmer Arboretum. I found lots of evidence of that stem boring moth that was, uh, it's a moth that uh, lays its eggs on the Phragmites, then the, the larva tunnels into uh, the, the stem the, in the early part of the season and uh, feeds on the stem. The drawback is it's already present and it really, although it's here, it's not making enough of a difference to control the plant. And I know that there was a, a fellow that's doing research at uh, University of Toronto, and he approached, um, somebody mentioned why marsh, but uh, I'm, I'm involved with uh, some Phragmites control at Tiny Marsh. It's not a small marsh, it's just in Tiny Township, but <laughs> it's a class one wetland, it's huge. But we have a Phragmites problem up there. And this person wanted to release this moth in the area. But even when I looked at his research, even he said that it may compromise the plant enough that other techniques may be more effective, but he recognized that it was not going to be a control. So at this point, there still is no biological control that has been identified and uh, and and the last few years, I saw a lot of um, aphids on the Phragmites leaves, but I saw absolutely no evidence of any withering of the leaves or anything. I just saw a lot of non-native ladybugs feeding on the aphids, and uh, you mm -hmm. know, and those are the biting ones. So, so it was all in all, it wasn't really, you know, that helpful. So anyway, that's my right. Two cents. Let, let me just pose one last question because we'll, we'll need to wrap up and Ellen has some announcements as well. Just on that same theme, um, I've seen a number of questions related to native Phragmites species. Are there actually some native, is there a native plant we need to look out for and, um, and keep there? Is that a problem or how do we deal with that? Maybe Nicole, you're, you probably could uh, address that to start. Sure. Um, yes, there is uh, a native lineage of Phragmites, and it looks very similar to the invasive, um, but there are some differences. Um, if anyone's interested, uh, I'm sure there's lots of resources online and there's um, lots of organizations are starting to do more research into it and providing more um, uh, resources for uh the, the difference in the identification. Um, but the, the native has some red patterning on the stem, but what's, what's tricky is sometimes the invasive also has that. Um, in addition, the native is 
tends to grow uh, in more of a sparse mixed with native vegetation. But there are times where it's in ideal conditions and it might grow into a dense monoculture, just like any species that has the ability uh, to right. do that when it yeah. doesn't have any threats. Um, but one thing that is interesting, the native Phragmites is uh, found the further north you go. Uh, that's not to say it's not in southern Ontario, um, but even on Georgian Bay, we have such a, just for an example, we have such a large um, range. We see a lot more of it uh, the farther we go north. So north of Point of Barrel, uh, there is a lot, a lot of it. Um, but as we uh, start going south, there is less, uh, less number of sites. Um, um, I do see it in more remote locations more often, um, but uh, I don't know if there's some science behind that <laughs> about the latitude at which it's growing at. It might be that it's being outcompeted by the invasive, which is more common in the southern parts of the province. Um, from my understanding, so if anyone knows otherwise, please correct me, but the native is not uh, a species at risk, but it still is threatened by the presence of invasive Phragmites. Right. So it, it will be, I've seen them sort of stand side by side uh, growing. It's almost like they're battling <laughs> um, or sometimes intermixed. And if Janice was here today, she would say the same thing. I think they see a lot of that um, stands that appear to be invasive, but once you get in there and start digging around, you start to see a few native stalks. So that does mm -hmm. become a challenge when uh, when you're doing your control. Right. So it's good to know about the identification between the right. two. Uh, Lynn and Jessica, any very quick comments on that native species? I don't know whether we're seeing that, Jessica, in Toronto. Do we save it? Do we cut it? Um, do we leave it alone? Um, I have never seen it in Toronto. Um, I don't know of anyone else who has seen it in Toronto. Uh, I see that Gavin Miller's on this call. I don't know that he has ever seen it <laughs> in Toronto, so it's not a, a particular uh, concern um, for us. Um, most often people will confuse canary reed grass with, um, with pragmites. That's another non-native uh, right. grass. So really, like, if you're cutting that down, like that's just, that's great. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Lynn, yeah. how about you? I, I feel I I've seen it um at Tiny Marsh uh in the wetland in the big wetland um growing in patches on its own apart from there's a lot of non-native stuff in there. Um I feel as though it is uh, a plant that if if it's in a natural wetland that has not been disturbed, that's more likely where you find it. And so that I think supports what Nicole said about farther north you go, you see it more often. I think the trouble with the GTA, uh, our area, there's really nothing about the land here that isn't disturbed. And right. I think that non-native stuff tends to uh, populate disturbed soils. Okay, great, thank you. Um, Nicole, Lynn and Jessica, thank you so much for your contributions today. It was a great learning process for me and I'm sure for the other panelists. Um, Ellen, I'm going to turn it over to you for final TFN announcements. Uh, thank you. Thank you. And, and again, my echo uh, Philip's comments. Wonderful to have you speakers sharing your Sunday afternoon. I mean, we had up to 90 or more participants on a Sunday afternoon, imagine. And, and thank you, especially to Philip, you know, because this was Philip's idea from the very beginning, a glint in his eye and he wouldn't let it go. And, and, he was absolutely right. So let me <laughs> let me thank you. And I'm going to very quickly share a few sneak peeks of what is coming up uh, and uh, in in uh, coming uh, months here. Um, so we have uh, our next our next speaker is um, is March five, uh, and it will be the Eastern Coyote, and it will be the co-founder of Coyote Watch Canada, Leslie Sampson, who's a very e expert in this field. So another fascinating talk, essentially exactly a month from now, um, and uh, you, you know I, I expect we'll we'll get lots of people coming, um, and then um, we have. Um, don't forget that in April 2nd, a Sunday afternoon, we look at the work of the Ontario Turtle Conservation Center. And May 7, we have another uh, very concerning uh, invasive species 
uh, the the jumping worms that that are a real problem for the for gardeners, horticultural industry, and and you know the ravines. So we have an expert telling us about that. So all of those dates, mark in your calendars, please. Um, we have for TFN members, we have walks outdoors happening this February in the Don Valley, Newton Brook Park, Mimico Creek, Mount Pleasant Cemetery, Ashbridges Bay, and Wilka Creek, all just this month. Uh, so no excuse to stay inside. And um, we hope to see you all on the trails. Thank you all for, for attending. It's It's been such a delight. And, um, and again, uh, you know, keep talking about Phragmites because, boy, keep doing stuff. <laughs> keep dealing with it. <laughs> it's, it's been an inspiring afternoon. Thank you. Okay, goodbye, everybody. We're right on time. Terrific.